So the new president is going to face significant challenges from acting on the conflict in Syria, where Russia is flexing its muscles, uh, to deciding how best to respond to China's assertion of hegemony in the Indo-Pacific region. I think there's also a big challenge of perception coming for the new president, by which I mean perception of the role and standing of the United States in international affairs. There's an ongoing debate, mostly within the US, but also outside, on whether or not the United States is in decline in global terms. Those who argue that it is note that the US economy has become less competitive. There's a shift in economic growth toward the developing world. There's what we've come to call the rise of the rest, that the US carries too much debt, it's on the edge of bankruptcy, and that the unipolar moment of unchallengeable American supremacy has passed, its opportunity squandered by ill-judged wars. That's the negative side. On the other hand, there are those who say, no, America's not in decline. They emphasize the predominance of American military power, certainly unmatched. They warn against the impact of withdrawal from its leadership roles. They argue that the US leads the world in education, technology, and innovation, and it has ge geographic and demographic advantages that will help it remain dominant. Ideological partisanship is very discernible in these debates. On the right, President Obama is regularly presented as a synonym for America's demise and its lack of leadership. On the left, there's a common perception that the US has acted with imperial hubris in international affairs, most evidently with the Bush administration's inauguration of a war on terror, a phrase you may have noticed that the Obama administration does not use. His administration has been instructed not to use it. However, most of the rest of us continue to. And an ongoing concern that the misuse of American power is somehow spawning violent global counter-movements. This discourse of international decline or malaise is not wholly the prerogative of Washington insiders and journalists. It's also represented by the many polls that seek Americans' opinions on the nations. And America must be the most polled people on earth. I mean, everyone gets polled several times a day. They seek Americans' opinions on the nation's global role and its standing. In recent years, there have been many indicators of public doubts about the exceptionalism of the United States. In 2014, for example, a Pew poll uh, showed that 28% of Americans believe, quote, the United States stands above all other countries in the world. That's down from 10% from a few years previously. In the same year, only 15% of 18 to 29-year-olds expressed that belief. Such views are synonymous with a wariness about global leadership and engagement. In a Pew Research poll this year on how Americans view the US role in the world, 57% say, quote, the United States should deal with its own problems. Now, in some ways, that's not surprising. Historically, the United States has moved between periods of engagement and isolationism. It's currently in a, period, a period of isolationism, mainly because the Obama administration pulled back from the adventurism that had been shown by George W. Bush. One of the presidential candidates, Donald Trump, has been tapping into this isolationist mood in the United States. His slogan, I'm sure you know it, make America great again, it feeds off the anxiety about America's future and its role in the world. Americans are uncertain and worried, and their views on foreign affairs are contributing to the roiling of the presidential election. So we have two very different candidates vying for the presidency with very different views on foreign affairs and America's role in the world. So what I would like to do is offer a few observations on what I think are the key differences between these candidates and a few comments on how they might respond to certain um, foreign policy issues if they do become president of the US. Hillary Clinton is a Washington insider and part of the foreign policy establishment. Uh, if she takes over from President Obama, that should be a fairly smooth process, <coughs> providing continuity. Though there are signs that she will move away from his policy of what's sometimes called strategic patience. Um, she is certainly more hawkish than President Clinton. Um, when she stepped down as Secretary of State, China's leading daily, state-run daily newspaper, the Global Times, uh, stated this, quote, for the Chinese people, the hard line of former US Secretary of State has been unforgettable. Uh, Hillary Clinton wore statements like that as a, a badge of pride. As Secretary of State, she advocated the use of what she termed smart power. She, so she, she really had thought through how she wanted to uh, perform this role of Secretary of State. She was very conscious that the United States um, 
was in a, 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 a new geopolitical relationship to other parts of the world where its, its power had to be used, dispensed in a new way and in a careful way. And so she, she, she thought through this idea of, of smart power and she defined it as follows. Uh, it's choosing the right combination of tools, the diplomatic, the economic, the military, the political, the legal and the cultural for each situation. And she would give the invasion of Libya in 2011 or the nuclear deal with Iran as good examples of this, 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 uh, this smart power at work. She advocates, in other words, the use of all the tools of American power, and especially diplomacy and development. The combination between the two is quite distinctive as she, when she was Secretary of State. And I'll see, I think we'll see her um, pushing those ideas again if she is president. She strongly argued for the elevation of development in advancing national security, the idea being to, use, um, to solve problems abroad before they reach the American shore. She um, is a strong supporter of NATO, arguing that it serves American interests by creating a large block of opposition to Russian expansion. And she says that uh, NATO allies have rallied to the United States in its times of need and cannot be deserted now. She was referring especially to 9-11. She has consistently advocated making women's human rights a priority in international relations. And this certainly does place her, her part within uh, American statecraft. In 1995 in Beijing, when she was first lady, she famously said, quote, women's rights are human rights. As Secretary of State, she took a strong interest in promoting um, counterterrorism initiatives uh, from her role in the State Department, including the Global Counterterrorism Forum, which would allow security professionals to come together from around the world to share knowledge and best practice. Hillary Clinton supports drone strikes in instances where, as she puts it, suspected terrorists cannot be captured or brought to justice. And she sees this as, quote, as part of a larger smart power terrorism strategy. She has advocated the closure of Guantanamo Bay Detention Center in Cuba. It represents, she says, in the eyes of the world, abuse, secrecy, and contempt for the rule of law. Rather than keeping us more secure, Guantanamo is harming our national security. So those are broadly some of the perspectives and opinions uh, that Hillary Clinton holds and uh, has held as Secretary of State and gives us some clues as to how she might act in the future. In sharp contrast to Clinton, Donald Trump unnerves the foreign policy establishment in Washington. Uh, this summer, 50 Republican foreign policy experts signed a letter denouncing Donald Trump, saying he was unfit to be commander-in-chief. Um, he presents a kind of wild card uncertainty to the establishment. His mantra is, quote, everything is negotiable. Uh, a view that promises to imperil nuanced diplomacy and alliances that the US has spent some time uh, building around the world. Under a Trump presidency, it seems that treaty obligations are going to be subject to renegotiation. He's dismissive of America's investment in the European integration project since World War II, and generally dismissive of matters of transatlantic security. He's not likely to support uh, the transatlantic um, trade treaty. Uh, tax conflicts with Europe are possible. Essentially, as a number of commentators have pointed out, Trump sees foreign affairs as a business deal. And actually, he's fairly consistent views on that. That's not new. In 1990, he gave an interview, admittedly in Playboy magazine, where he said, and I quote, we Americans are laughed at around the world for losing $150 billion after, year after year, for defending wealthy nations for nothing, nations that would be wiped off the face of the earth in about 15 minutes if it weren't for us. Our allies are making billions by screwing us. End quote. And more recently, he's used phrases like free riders to describe these allies. Trump says that he would consider withdrawing US forces from South Korea and from Japan if they didn't increase what he calls their financial contribution. Uh, he wants NATO to pay more as well. He's also said that NATO has become obsolete, by which he means that it is not uh, fit for purpose to fight terrorism. He's issued a number of statements, quite reckless in my view, on nuclear weapons and on the rules of war. He is opposed to efforts to close Guantanamo. Indeed, he says he would like to increase the number of detainees there. On interrogation, torture if you prefer that term, he says on harsh interrogation techniques, I should say, quote, if the use of these methods would enhance the protection and safety of the nation, they should be used. Their effectiveness may be in dispute, but nothing should be taken off the table when American lives are at stake. He generally supports U.S. counterterrorism practices, including government surveillance. Uh, on NASA's program to collect bulk data, he says, 
It's certainly something, uh, not something I like, but when you have all these maniacs over the world, we have to do something in taking that little bit of an extra step, end quote. And finally, in terms of the general observations of his foreign policy perspective, he has not advocated making women's human rights a priority in international relations. So just a few of the hot spots that um, are presently pretty hot and that the new president's going to have to attend to, uh, in no particular order. Uh, Russia is what I've scribbled first here. Both, um, well, let me start with uh, Mrs. Clinton. Mrs. Clinton, President, um, Russian President Vladimir Putin, are not close friends. During the 2008 presidential election, Clinton said of Putin, and I quote, he's a KGB agent. By definition, he doesn't have a soul, end quote. Mr. Putin responded by saying, quote, I think at a minimum it's important for a government leader to have a brain, end quote. Now, this is not a high level of political discourse or diplomatic um, give and take. There's not much humor involved. In 2009, though, Clinton did try to, as she put it, reset the U.S. relation with Russia. In fact, she posed in one of the worst photo ops she did as a Secretary of State, beside Vladimir Putin with a huge bright red button that said reset, um, in case people didn't get the idea. It's now a bit embarrassing. Um, and the idea was to seek greater co cooperation, without a doubt. Now, her critics on the conservative side have said that this was naive and it emboldened Putin, perhaps. But Clinton has pointed to what she thinks have been successes of um, of that effort to ameliorate, uh, particularly the sanctions in Iran, and also Russia joining the WTO, the World Trade Organization. At any rate, by the end of her tenure, she did write to President Obama in a memo that later was, uh, became public, warning that uh, the reset was at an end and that relations with Russia were deteriorating quite badly. Clinton argues that the US should respond to Ru Putin's imperial tendencies by strengthening NATO but also by improving energy security for those European countries who are too dependent on Russian natural gas. She's also called for stronger efforts to, and measures to punish Russia for its transgressions in both the Ukraine and, as she sees it, in Syria. Relations have become very chilly between Russia and, um, uh, well, <laughs> and Mrs. Clinton during the US presidential elections, as there is evidence that Russia has hacked the Democratic National Committee's network and leaked emails in order to influence the election. Um, Mr. Trump on Russia. He has spoken about creating a new alliance with Russia, arguing that this can be done, and if it is done, then it becomes a fresh way of resetting uh, international affairs and dealing with Syria and other places in order to right IS, uh, Islamic State. Putin has said some very positive things about Mr. Trump, and in turn, Mr. Trump has praised Putin's brand of leadership. I quote, I will tell you, in terms of leadership, he's getting an A, and our president is not doing so well, end quote. If you know Donald Trump's discourse, he likes to give out numbers and letters in terms of ability and performance to various people. Um, in terms of the hacking, or the alleged hacking of the DNC's network, um, uh, Trump has refused to condemn Russia for this. And he's argued that, um, uh, he's argued away the claims um, uh, from uh, the Democrats and the Democratic Party that Russia is deliberately trying to undermine Clinton's candidacy. Uh, even though he's been advised by a range of uh, intelligence experts that that is the case, he refuses to accept that point. So next, China. Mrs. Clinton has argued for increased cooperation with China in uh, quite a number of areas of common interest. She says that our countries share, quote, a positive, cooperative, and comprehensive relationship. Um, and she was uh, a leading US official back in 2009 launching an annual meeting between US and China that focused on economic and strategic issues. At the same time, she has also been a consistent and constant critic of China's human rights record, and has also spoken out about matters of what she terms internet freedom, um, criticizing China for have, quote, stepped up their, inter their censorship of the internet. Mr. Trump has attracted China for, from his opening speech as a candidate, the very first speech, claiming it dumped its exports and is devaluing its currency in its own interest. Mr. Trump says that he would, be, he would threaten the Chinese government with tariffs if it should not agree to change established trade agreements. Quote, if they don't come to the table, they're going to have a tax when they put their product into this country and they're going to behave, end quote. He also says he would build up a United States military presence in um, the South China Sea with the view to both deterring 
China's naked territorial claims to the, the islands there, but also support the US bargaining with China on economic matters. Immigration. Mrs. Clinton has called for comprehensive immigration legislation. Now, this would include a path to full citizenship for those who are in the United States illegally. Calculated at more than 11 million undocumented. We think there might be about 50,000 Irish amongst those, but the figures are not entirely accurate. Mostly Hispanic, as I'm sure you know. She supports executive action under the Obama administration that seeks to protect uh, millions of people from deportation, uh, including people who are brought to the United States as children, a birthright issue. Um, Mr. Trump has made immigration a core issue of his presidential campaign, as I'm sure you know, grabbing headlines with controversial declarations. He has claimed that Mexico was sending violent criminals, including rapists, into the United States. He's pledged, as I'm sure you know as well, to build a 1,000-mile wall that will be paid for by Mexico and that that will somehow secure the southern border of the United States. He wants to triple the number of immigration officers. And he's also proposed deporting the nearly 11 million uh, undocumented immigrants believed to be currently living in the United States. He wants to end birthright citizenship, uh, unlike, Pres unlike uh, <laughs> Mrs. Clinton. Um, He's also called for, and this is interesting, I thought, I only came across it recently, he's called for a requirement by visa applicants to obtain an, quote, ideological certification that ensures we admit to our country only those who share our values and love our people. Now, whether he stands by any of these things is absolutely unclear, but these are things that he has said. Um, also, this is not, his, 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 his comments on immigrants are, and immigration are not fully um, uh, directed toward Mexico and to South and Latin America. Uh, in December of 2015, after the tax in San Bernardino in California, he proposed temporarily banning all Muslims from entering the country. And later, in June of this year, he said, quote, I would suspend immigration from areas of the world where there's a proven history of terrorism against the US, Europe, or, or our allies, end quote. He's also talked about introducing a screening process, but it's, it's really unclear how any of that would work. Uh, just a couple more comments then. On Iran, uh, I think important to, to, to comment on. As Secretary of State, uh, Mrs. Clinton was part of um, the increase in sanctions against Iran, very stringent sanctions during the early years of the Obama administration. And many commentators say this definitely helped bring Iran to negotiate the new nuclear deal. More recently, she has struck a somewhat tougher stance than President Obama on Iran. She has said that while she supports the nuclear deal, quote, my approach will be distrust and verify. We should anticipate that Iran will test the next president. They'll want to see if they can bend the rules. That won't work if I'm in the White House, end quote. Um, she has said that in her view, Iran continues to violate UN Security Council resolutions through the testing of missiles. And she is prepared to have new sanctions placed against the country uh, unless, um, unless something is done about this. Mr. Trump has described Iran as, quote, the biggest sponsor of terrorism around the world and says that he will dismantle that network of terrorism. But he has offered no detail on how he would do that. He has repeatedly criticized the nuclear agreement, saying at first that it would have to be completely overhauled, but more recently and consistently saying he would get rid of it entirely. He says the US has received few concessions while Iran was given access to quote, $150 billion that had been frozen. He said, I'll dismantle the deal, um, but he has no precise plan on how he would actually do that. And finally, moving toward conclusions, uh, Islamic State and Syria, which I've somewhat put together here for early, fairly obvious reasons. In 2012, Mrs. Clinton supported arming and training what she termed moderate or vetted Syrian rebels. Uh, and she has since said that President Obama waited too long to do this and that this contributed to the rise of IS and other militant groups. Again, that more hawkish discourse that we hear a lot uh, from um, Mrs. Clinton. She's also said that uh, Kurdish forces should play a bigger role in combating IS uh, and is certainly interested in expanding um, US airstrikes in Iraq and Syria in order to defeat the terror networks. In 2015, she asked that government agencies, US government agencies, start to work with technology companies in the United States to underline and combat the online presence of extremist groups. 
In particular, she was targeting Islamic State's ability to use social media to proselytize and recruit and train uh, those it was outreaching to. She's also said that the United States should play a bigger role in helping resolve um, the crisis caused by migrants fleeing Syria. In 2015, she said that she would, the US should accept up to 65,000 Syrian refugees. Obama had only proposed 10,000. The biggest difference between Mrs. Clinton and President Obama in this area is her readiness to create a no-fly zone over, over Syria. Uh, this could put the US, or probably would put the US, in direct uh, conflict with Russia. At the third presidential debate, she said, and I quote, I'm going to continue to push for a no-fly zone and safe havens within Syria, not only to protect the Syrians and prevent the constant outflow of refugees, but to, frankly, gain some leverage on both the Syrian government and the Russians so that perhaps we can have the kind of serious negotiation necessary to bring the conflict to an end, end quote. Mr. Trump has said that he won't give a fully detailed plan to defeat Islamic State because then there would be no surprise. Um, however, he says we will, quote, bomb the shit out of the group's oil operations, end quote. Sorry, his language is colorful, but I think you know that. He said he would be willing, no more than that, would be willing to put American troops on the ground in Syria. He said, my generals tell me, whoever they are, up to 20 or 30,000 American troops would be needed. And to deal with terrorists, he's proposed changing international rules um, on military use of torture. He also proposed killing family members um, of terrorists in order to create a deterrent to others. He somewhat backed away from those comments uh, in the last year. He, like uh, Mrs. Clinton, has said he would restrict uh, Islamic State's ability to use the internet. He's got a rather odd phrasing for that. He says, we've got to take back the internet. Uh, again, it's not quite sure how he's going to take it back. Um, he has an interesting point to make when he argues, and he has done so consistently, that the Gulf states need to do more to fight IS and also to help with refugees. But a key part of his Syria strategy appears to be giving Russia the room to stabilize and to do what pretty much it wants in the region, at least currently. Um, on the current efforts to take the city of Mosul from Islamic State, he refers to it as a mistake. He said there was no element of surprise, so it's, it's a mistake. But he also says it's an effort by Obama to boost Clinton's candidacy, to make her look good while this time falls. Only yesterday, he said that the US should focus on defeating IS rather than moving, removing Hassad in Syria. Quote, you're going to end up in World War III over Syria if we listen to Hillary Clinton. You're not fighting Syria anymore. You're fighting Syria, Russia, and Iran, end quote. Now that view, whilst apocalyptic in his discourse, is not without echo amongst military leaders in the United States, interestingly enough. Uh, at a congressional hearing um, last month, the chair of the Joint Chiefs Marine General uh, Joseph Dunford told uh, the lawmakers at present, quote, a no-fly zone in Syria could spell war with Russia. Right now, Senator, the Senator who was questioning him, for us to control all of the airspace in Syria, it would require us to go to war against Syria and Russia, end quote. Now, this is an issue where I think there'll be a lot of immediate pressure and attention should Mrs. Clinton be elected president. So, just a couple of conclusions at this time, yeah? I think Mrs. Clinton has a tricky line to walk, signaling on the one hand her more hawkish approach to foreign policy than President Obama, yet still supporting an engaged foreign policy based on diplomacy and development, and aware that the American public are both weary and wary of foreign interventions. Clinton, I think, will probably turn to formal officials uh, for her foreign affairs team and expertise. Uh, we can't be sure who those will be, but at the moment it looks quite possible that Jake Sullivan, who has served as her head of policy at the State Department, is currently her campaign policy director, uh, would be the new national security advisor. John Podesta, who's currently campaign chair, uh, possibly the new secretary of state. Podesta played a key role in helping arrange the climate accord between President Obama and President Xi of China. With Donald Trump, it's a hard guess. Um, when he listed his foreign policy lineup um, in March, first of all, and it's been rejigged several times since, one 
leading Republican foreign policy expert said, this is a pudding without a theme. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but it wasn't nice. Um, uh, and, and as I said, 50 uh, Republican foreign policy experts wrote a public letter to say that Donald Trump was not fit to be commander in chief. So in order to get a foreign policy team, he had to sort of somewhat beat the bushes. And it's not an elite team, it has to be said. There are some very good minds on there, but they're not necessarily an elite team. Um, at the moment, uh, his key military advisor is um, retired General Michael Flynn, who was a former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency and has now been slated as potentially the new Secretary of Defense if Donald Trump becomes president. Uh, the other slatings that have been put out uh, to, to be gossiped about on the internet or on the media are Rudy Giuliani, new Department of Homeland Security head, quite possibly. Um, a Secretary of State's interesting, maybe John Bolton, who was the former UN ambassador, he's favored by some, or Bob Corker, who's the Republican chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But I'll stop there because people like to play games with all these names and who knows where we're going to end up. Um, it's going to be interesting.